years ago I was here and I spoke and I wanted to impress the audience by saying something in Spanish and the best thing I could come up with is uh, soy un ombria, which I think means I'm an umbrella. <laughs> so uh, today I corrected it and now it's going to be soy un paraguas, which I was told is the better umbrella. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, today I want to speak about consciousness. Uh, but I saw the previous speakers uh, and I realized that uh, if I want to get the science correctly, I need to entice you with something that's going to be Mexican. So I'm going to talk about consciousness and football. Uh, they look the same, they're both round, the brain and the football, they rotate in the same direction. But the reality is that uh, football is what got me here. So about two years ago, after I spoke at Ciudad, a number of speakers went to visit the Count of Salinas' house. And we stayed there, and at some point we ventured to the house, and Andres and I saw a little uh, footballing machine that was sitting there. And we decided, let's try to play a game get together. And there were four of us. It was Andres and Pamela, Esther Perel, who spoke here, and myself, playing doubles against each other. <laughs> and the game got very, very tight, very emotional. We got to a score of 8-8, eight, eight, up to 10, when Andrea said, uh, let's make it serious. Let's put stakes on that. Yeah. And, uh, and he said, uh, whoever uh, wins gets something that they want, and what I want, Moan, is to come back to Ciudad with an even more epic idea. So we lost, <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> So, a number of things happened since this uh, soccer game. First of all, uh, what you will learn is that whoever you play soccer with, even in a football league, becomes uh, really significant in your life. As a matter of fact, uh, Pamela and Andres didn't just win the match, they actually then got married, and I was asked to come again and be one of the officiants of their wedding, where I spoke about uh, things. So, uh, now you should know that I'm also doing weddings, funerals, bar mitzvahs, kisneras, anything that you want to get your local science come and speak to you, uh, your audience or anything, but actually I want to use this wedding to talk about consciousness. Because one of the things that I mentioned uh, in the wedding was that weddings have numerous purposes, and one of them is to bring the community together. So yes, it's about a couple who's getting married, but to, in many ways you need the entire village. We used to live in villages where everyone was accountable for us. If things didn't work out between us two, there would be someone who could help us. And in many ways, the idea of a village becomes harder and harder as the world becomes bigger. And what I want to talk about is how villages allow us to connect brains. Okay, so consciousness is a topic I want to talk about and how we can connect brains and form a bigger consciousness that becomes a bigger village. And to explain how this works, I'm going to start by saying how we can actually break consciousness. How we can actually take one conscious mind and break it into two, and then we learn how we can actually make two and make them into something bigger. Here's an example. You see two pictures here. You clearly tell that there's a difference between them. One of them is a regular house, and the other one is a house on fire. However, if a patient were to be here, and this patient were to suffer from something that we call hemi-station neglect, they would see this picture. Hemispatial neglect means that a person does not see part of the world. In this example, the left side. So a person with that neglect would just look at two pictures and would say they're the same. But here's the thing. Their eyes get information from the entire world, so even though the conscious awareness says it's the same picture, somewhere in their brain, the information about the other side, the left side, the one that has differences, fire or not, picks up information. So if you ask the person to pick one of the images and say which ones they like most, often the person would say, I like more the one at the bottom. So even though they can't tell what the differences are, their conscious mind is understanding that there's a difference and it picks up the one that's safer. This means that even if our brain is divided into parts and those parts are not able to articulate what they're going through, somewhere else there is you who gets a sense of things. Let's try to look at this from a different angle. There's another way to break a brain into two, and that is to take the part of the brain that connects the left and the right hemispheres and cut it. There's a bridge in your brain that connects the left and the right, and the brain is symmetrical, so everything that exists on the left 
also exist on the right, just in the reverse order. So your left eye is controlled by the right side of the brain. Your right eye is controlled by the left side of the brain. Your left ear, right side, right ear, left side, and so on. But for some things, we only have one of, like our mouse. We have one mouse. So for that, nature does pick a sign. So language comes to the left. In the same way, solving problems comes from the right. And if you take a person whose brain was split in half because they had a problem that required a surgery to cut this, primarily epilepsy, to prevent the spread of surgery of the epilepsy across the brain, what you see is something remarkable. This person is asked to play a game where he's told to look at the shape and organize the cubes in the form of the shape. He has no problem doing it with his left arm because the left arm speaks to the part of the brain that solves puzzles. But when he's told to do the same thing with his right arm, he has a hard time because the right arm doesn't speak to the part of the brain that has problem solving, the bridge doesn't exist, and just struggles with doing this again and again. If you actually tell the guy to use both arms, you'll see what happens, because the left hand, it knows the answer, it really wants to help its friend. You'll see in a second how it really, really is eager to be involved in this, because it just feels that it knows what's going on. <laughs> but it's not going to work. If you let the guy use both of his hands, what you'll see is competition and arguments. They fight for dominance over this guy's consciousness. Both sides think that they know the answer, and they just argue. So in fact, our brain is made of multiple parts that all have their own agenda, and somehow they give rise to consciousness. If that's the case, one can ask the question, could we take a part from your brain, a part from my brain, and connect those, and make multiple brains speak to one another? And that's the future. So here are two entities, Pamela on the left, Andres on the right, and the question we ask is, can we fuse their brains such that you have a uh, pandres? <laughs> and the answer is, theoretically, yes. A number of labs have been proposing an idea by which you can create a brain bridge. You take brain of one person, and you start connecting wires to another person's brain, and gradually, if you connect them correctly, a third brain will emerge. And this third brain isn't just the sum of two entities, it will actually, the theory said, will become a, diff a different thing. It won't be just Andres and Pamela as one, it would be a third thing that would think it is one and wouldn't even know that there were two parts, just like you guys all have left and right hemispheres. And you don't really think of them as two separate things, you just think of you as one, so will this entity. As soon as you fuse the brains, it will think there's just me. For example, if a doctor came to this person and says, you know, you have a tumor on your left side of the brain, and the only way to save your life is to reflect this part, the person would say, sure, take it out. And in doing so, it might kill what used to be addressed before. The same way, if someone came to you and said, hey, you know, you have a tumor on your left hemisphere, you've got to take it out, you would say yes, realizing that at that point, you take part of you that thinks it's one and getting rid of it. So, the important thing to understand is not there yet. This is theoretical. The theory that looks at animals and connections shows that as we gradually connect things, somehow different things happen. But the reason I wanted to talk about it right now is because it seems like everyone wants that. The world is full of people who talk about how to connect brains. And right now, the best way we think about doing that is actually putting a chip in one person's brain, another chip in a different person's brain, and letting the power of connectivity through the internet or Bluetooth actually share ideas. So a number of people in Silicon Valley primarily, like those guys, uh, Elon Musk, Brian Johnson, or in France, uh, Ali Ben Abid, are all looking at different ways to connect the brains to machines, to put a chip inside your head that will read your brain activity and will communicate it to the outside world. Just a few months ago, a remarkable work from Ben Abid came out that showed that you can take a person who couldn't move and connect their brain to an exoskeleton that allowed them to stand up after years of not being able to do that and walk. So this is the first uh, evidence for connecting your brain to machines that will actually aid you get out of it. And if you take it to the extreme, you can imagine an entire soccer team. Here's a people again. That's all made of people who just before the plant was in their brain could not walk. People that are disabled, paraplegic, that suddenly get an input in their brain that allows them to rise and get power again. To make it even more profound, two chips in two different brains were shown first by a colleague of mine, Miguel Nicolelis, where he put a chip in a mouse's brain in Rio de Janeiro, and another chip in a mouse's brain at Duke University in North Carolina. One mouse in Rio de Janeiro goes into its chamber and sees two 
closed echo chambers that have cheese in one of them. It really tries to dig into the cheese, but it can't open it. But it thinks the thoughts that would make its brain say, I want to open the right chamber. This thought is then sent over the internet to Duke, where another mouse sits and gets stimulated and thinks, oh, I guess I should pull the right lever. And in doing that, it sends a signal back to Rio de Janeiro, where the chamber is open. So the mouse in Rio de Janeiro just thinks it wants the chamber to be opened, and second later, it does. Not knowing that its brain talked to another mouse's brain, and back, and made it happen. Mm -hmm. So here is the evidence of connecting two brains that starts going there. And because we're starting to show evidence for this happening, I want to tell you exactly what are the limits. Because they're not neuroscience. There are three things that need to happen for you to have brains that speak to one another. The first thing, you have to know the neuroscience work. This we already have. We already know how to read brain activity, we already know how to write into brains, we already know how the neuroscience work. There's a lot of engineering that needs to be done there to make it perfect, but we all know the language of the brain. The second thing that we are struggling with right now is delivery. How do you get the chip inside the brain? Most of the work right now by the people I mentioned earlier, Elon Musk, Brian Johnson, and so on, is spent on trying to get the chip into your brain. Right now, the only way we know to do that is to drill a hole in the skull and put the chip on the surface of your brain. Not ideal. Mm. Not many people want that. So the question is, can we give you something that you can eat or inject, and it will become a chip inside your brain? That's where all the problems are right now. And the third, and the one I want you to be mostly uh, aware of, is the ethical one. We don't really know yet that we want it. The reality is that if you offer people a chip inside their brain, they all get excited. But there are a lot of things that will happen if you have a chip inside your brain that might be undesired. For example, we spent a lot of time in my lab looking at what will happen if you put a chip inside your brain when it comes to controlling people's minds. And the idea is that our minds are not ready for this. We don't have an idea to vet thoughts that are coming from the inside that are not ours. So easily, if you have a chip inside your brain, we can imagine a world where someone would change your mind, or hack your brain, or create thoughts, or even create different species with different IQ levels. So some would be much smarter than the other. And all of us can hear that and think if it's good or bad, but the reality is that we mostly hear the good side and forget the bad side. And what I wanted to highlight is that there are risks, and you should think about both. To make it clear, I can tell you that in the US right now, there are already about 4,000 people that have a chip inside their brain, for clinical purposes. And when we asked people in a survey recently, if it were allowed for any person, not just for clinical purposes, but any person, to put a chip inside their brain, but also there would be some negative consequences, like it would make a, for an unequal thinking. Some would be, would be much, much smarter than the others. Would you take it? I was hoping for some people to think that it's terrible, terrible, but the reality was that in a survey of 100,000 people, most people said I would like it, like it. So all of us are excited by the chip in their brain, overseeing the negative parts. And what I wanted to finish by saying is that there's a risk here. And to decide if you want to do this or not, every person has to wait on this before it becomes reality. We neuroscientists are working towards building those chips in the brain. We're trying to push the envelope as much as we can, as fast as we can, and we care about making it possible. But whether it's good or bad, it's something that we should talk about right now, when it's not yet there, so we can weigh in on that. And if you talk about it, ask your politicians, ask your local mayor, ask your friends about it, then the topic would become something that people care about already. They would stop coming with answers. They would stop asking themselves, should we allow it or not? And this is something that we all should be engaging right now, before it's there, so we can decide if we want to be in a world where everyone can have a device inside their brain, it controls their thought, give them IQ, but also might be manipulated by others and change your mind, not just for the better, but also for worse. I hope you're gonna leave this room with this thought in mind, because this will be the village that I was hoping for. Thank you so much.